Hey class, welcome back to Interpersonal Communication. And this week we're going to cover chapter four on emotions. So let's start. In this chapter, we will cover three aspects of um, emotions, which, is, which are the important differences between emotions, feelings, and moods, and the best approaches to managing negative moods. We're also going to talk about ways in which gender and personality influence emotion, as well as how to deal with emotional challenges such as managing anger, communicating empathy online, handling fading romantic pa uh, passion, and suffering grief. All right, let's start from the beginning. Let's talk about how to define emotion. So. In the textbook, emotion is defined as an intense reaction to an event that involves interpreting event meaning, becoming physiologically aroused, labeling the experience as emotional, managing reactions, and communicating through emotional displays and disclosures. So if we take a look at this um, definition of emotion, then we can definitely break it down into five elements. So here are the five key features of emotions. Number one is that it is reactive. And by saying that it is reactive, we understand it that we, um, our emotions respond to something that happened uh, outside of us. So for instance, um, if we receive bad news or negative news, then we would feel sad or we would feel um, anger. So there is that sort of specific emotions that is washing through us. Um, and then the next element is actually it involves physiological changes. So we understand that when we're feeling certain kind of emotions, there are physiological changes that are happening in our body. For instance, um, when you're angry, what part of your body that feels the heat um, or when you're feeling sad which part of your body that's feelings the heaviness of the emotion for instance so we understand that um, there are some physiological changes that are happening when we are um, experiencing the emotions we also understand that it involves cognitive interpretation um, I'm going to talk more about this, as well as talking about how it is constrained by historical, cultural, relational, and situational norms, and how it involves a variety of verbal and nonverbal expressions. So, um, just like when I was uh, talking about physiological changes, it will involve um, increased heart rate, elevated blood sugar, slowed digestions, as well as pupil dilation. So it is not a surprise, for instance, when you are so stressed, you're uh, experiencing stress, that you will have elevated blood sugar. Um, or when you are so angry, um, you will see it in how your pupil would dilate. So according to Ackman uh, in 1972, there are six primary emotions that all human beings um, basically feel it and show it that involve unique and consistent behaviors across cultures. And these six primary emotions include anger, fear, disgust, happiness or joy, sadness and surprise. So regardless of what your cultural background is, when you're feeling angry, or when you are fearful of something, or when you're feeling happy or joyful, then your physiological changes are going to show it in your facial expressions, in your increased heart rate, for instance, in the elevated blood sugar, regardless of your cultural background. And I find that this is very interesting that we humans, regardless of our skin color, of our, um, what is it, status of citizenship, for instance, no matter where, which country you're coming from, you're all experiencing the six primary emotions. Um, and when we're saying that we express our emotions 
both verbally and non-verbally, we can take a look at these pictures and we, all of us, just like we talk about the six primary emotions, we will be able to tell that, for instance, the ch this child is feeling angry. We can see it in how he expresses um, himself. Um, and in this one, we can immediately tell that this child is feeling, is, um, what is it, surprised by something, right? And you can take a look at it from, again, his facial expression. And here in the in this picture, by looking at the eyes and the expressions of this woman, we can understand that she looks like she's experiencing the emotions of being sad. Now, when it comes to cognitive interpretations, we understand that the physiological changes associated with fear are similar to those that accompany excitement joy and other emotion so based on physiological responses alone it may be difficult to distinguish between trembling with fear and quivering with excitement sometimes the difference is in the matter of interpretations and labeling research shows that appraisal is vastly superior to suppressing one's feeling it often leads to lower stress and increased productivity so once we are able to label or interpret the emotions that we are currently um, having, then we will be able to handle it or think about how to handle it so that it doesn't engulf us in that particular emotion. So our ability to actually name and understand the emotions that we are feeling right now, that's part of what we uh, label as cognitive interpretations. And when it comes to verbal expressions, um, it says that putting emotions into words can help us manage them more effectively. So this one is linked very closely to the cognitive interpretation. We also want to talk about feelings and moods. So we often talk about emotions, feelings, and moods as if they are the same thing, but they are not. Feelings are short-term emotional reactions to events that generate only limited arousal. So they do not typically trigger attempts to manage their experience or expression. Yeah. Uh, whereas emotion occur occasionally in response to substantial events and feelings arise frequently in response to everyday incidents. In terms of arousal, moods are low intensity states such as boredom, contentment, grouchiness or serenity that are not caused by particular events and typically last longer than feelings or emotions. So we understand that if you take a look at your textbook, you will see uh, an image of how feelings, moods and emotions are different. Um, and we understand that feelings are more short terms moods are more low intensity but typically last longer whereas emotions are, are something that we experience when we are triggered by substantial events all right so here are the influences on emotional expression we understand that not everybody expressed their emotions um, in the same way right because of our personality would affect the way we express our emotion, the culture that we grow up in, the gender, social conventions and roles, also social media, and emotional contagion. And I will spend some time talking about emotional contagion here. So um, if you take a look again at your book, you will see that um, in chapter three, we talk about the uh, five big five personality traits and that three out of those five actually affects the way we express our emotion. Um, some people tend to be more, for instance, um, extroverted. They would express their emotions readily, whereas other people tend to be more um, introverted and they don't express their emotion freely. Um, and then when we're talking about culture, culture, 
also affects the way we express our emotion because certain culture actually ask or kind of like cultivate in you the way to not show your emotion yeah you need to remain calm you need to remain um as if you have full control of your emotions whereas in other cultures um, people are more freely express their emotions yeah and gender also plays a part in this because uh, according to your book it says that women actually experiences sadness right fear and shame more often than men and men express anger much more freely than female i know these are based on gender norms and i want to ask you about this in the uh, lecture check questions for the discussion boards we also talk about how social conventions and roles like where the society you grow uh, grew up in actually have certain expectations of how you express your emotions um, let's talk about for instance in a classroom discussions there is that social conventions and roles that when you have uh, discussions in the classroom you're expected to be um, in full control of your emotions even when we're talking about matters that are important to you that um, may arouse your, arouse your um, emotions but you still are not allowed to express it aggressively for instance but you need to be able to manage how you express your emotion during that academic uh, discussions in the classroom now this is co completely different in social media if you have noticed um, how in social media people tend to hide behind their profile they would probably create a profile that is not true just so that they are able to express their emotions um, in a way that is not productive and i think that is one part or what we call as the dark side of social media is that how people sometimes forget that when they're expressing their emotions they're expressing it towards somebody who are behind that profile as well so that's again that's the dark side of the social media and now we're talking about emotional contagion so when we're talking about emotional contagions we understand that emotions can spread from one person to another through a process known as emotional contagion. So have you ever, uh, for instance, walk into a room, like in a classroom, and where apparently everybody, every student in that classroom was just having just, you know, bad moments or something that really influenced their emotions. As a result, the temperature in that room becomes very heavy or the atmosphere in that room becomes very heavy and so even though you are not feeling sad or uh, maybe slightly depressed when you walk into that room suddenly the air changes and so you started to feeling the you started to feel the heaviness in the air and your emotions started to get darker and darker so that's um, an example of emotional contagion I, I shouldn't have given you a, a dark and somber example I can also give an example of where you may not feel the best um, you may not your emotion was just neutral but when you step in into the classroom and you feel all the energy everybody is happy everybody's joyful like it or not your um, emotion get lifted um, and suddenly you feel a bit of joy and happiness as well and that is what we call as emotional contagion and then um, we understand that as a human being we need to have emotional intelligence that is the ability to actually regulate our emotion right and so how is it that we're able to do this we're able to do to do this when we have self-awareness or the ability to recognize and understand our own emotions um, people may think that it's easy to understand that right now we're feeling angry or we're feeling sad or um, for instance we're feeling worried but not everybody can put a label to it immediately so the ability to recognize and understand your own emotion is very important 
and that shows as the first step to emotional intelligence. The second one is self-regulation, which is the ability to regulate and manage your emotions. You know that even though currently you're not feeling, your emotions is not feeling happy or joyful, but when you're surrounded by people who are feeling happy and joyful, you're able to actually be happy and joyful for them as well. And you regulate your, maybe you still have some negative emotions that are lingering and decide to process them when you have stepped out from that situation. And that self-regulation is uh, the next step to emotional intelligence. The third one is motivation, which is the ability to seek things that lead to internal rewards. Yeah, That you have a motivation that you want um, to be able to regulate your emotion so that um, how you respond or react to other person or the other people are not going to be something that is not effective yeah so you want to make sure that you have a strong motivation so that you will be able to regulate your emotion and make sure that the way you express your uh, emotion is going to be effective and productive for everyone in the in the room in that context you also want to make sure that you have empathy, which is the ability to understand how others are feeling and respond accordingly. So if your close friend is feeling sad because of uh, something that happened uh, in his or her life, then you would have the empathy to support him or her or them so that um, they would feel like they're not alone. The last one is social skills, which is the ability to interact well with others. Yeah. Um, so for a person to say that they have a good emotional intelligence, they would have to be able to hit all of these elements that make someone have a strong or a good emotional intelligence. All right. Um, and now the next one, we're going to talk about how to express emotions effectively. This is very similar, right, to having a good emotional intelligence. First is that you need to recognize your feelings or your emotion. And teaching children to recognize and label their emotion is foundational to building their emotional intelligence. The next one is choose the best language. Relying on a small vocabulary of feelings is as limiting as using only a few terms to describe colors. So you can improve emotional expressions by making it clear that your feeling or your emotion is centered on a specific set of circumstances rather than the whole relationship. So maybe currently you're feeling um, misunderstood, for instance, uh, by the other person. And instead of just dealing with it by being angry, you talk to them, the other person, by saying that, oh, you're disappointed that uh, the other person was uh, not able to understand you. And you talk about how can you make your emotions, your feelings become clearer to that person so that um, you know, or he knows, or they know what to do to communicate with you better in that situation. And then you need to be able to share multiple feelings. We need to understand that we not only have just one feelings or just one emotion at one time. Um, you can have multiple feelings or multiple emotions at the same time. That's why human beings are so complex, right? So despite it being commonplace to experience several emotions at the same time, we often communicate only one feeling and usually it's the most neg uh, negative one. So for instance, um, you and your friend have plans to go and see a movie, but your friend uh, arrived late, right? And your friend didn't let you know that um, they are going to arrive late. And so you're worried because you tried to call them and they didn't pick up their phone. Apparently the, what is it? The phone battery was dead and there was no way for them to charge the phone. So when they finally showed up, what you basically uh, would tell them is just how angry you were for them being irresponsible and not trying to let you know that they're going to be late and now they're going to, you both are going to miss the movie and so on. But you didn't communicate the fact that you're worried uh, over the fact that 
you tried to call them, but they didn't pick up. So even though you have this multiple emotions, feeling worried, feeling um, angry, feeling disappointed at the same time, the one thing that showed up was just the feeling of angry because it's the most negative one and it's the easiest one for you to express. Yeah. So at that moment, when you have emotional intelligence, you, you probably would like to ask why they were late and say how worried you were that um, you were not able to reach out to them and that the consequences was that you're probably going to be late for the movie. And, and um, in the heat of the moment, it's very hard. And so be able to express your emotion effectively would definitely affect how the, the turnout of that um, event is going to be like. The next one is recognize the difference between feeling and acting. Remember, just because you feel a certain way doesn't mean you must act on it. This is hard. I find it to be hard. Um, and so to be able to actually recognize the difference between feeling and acting and knowing what you need to do is, um, is a mark of uh, being able to express your emotions effectively. And then accept responsibility for your feelings. Yeah, that you're feeling the way you feel and um, that you know what the consequences are. And then choose the best time and place to express your feelings. Yeah. Again, this is always much easier said than done, I think. All right. So uh, when it comes to managing emotions, we know that there are two types of emotions here. And these are facilitative and debilitative emotions. So it's important to differentiate facilitative, uh, facilitative emotions, which are contributing to effective functioning from debilitative emotions, which are hindering or preventing effective performance. So positive emotions such as joy and love are obviously facilitative. Much of the time, emotions such as anger or fear are debilitative. One big difference between facilitative and debilitative emotion is their intensity. Another big difference is that debilitative feelings tend to have extended duration. Yeah, It's so easy for us to hold on to our anger and our fear much longer than it's necessary. Um, whereas happiness can be a bit fleeting. So we need to understand how the intensity and the duration of it affects how we manage these emotions. Social scientists call this rumination, uh, recurrent thoughts that not demanded by the immediate environment. Yeah. So for instance, if we have a strong um, fear towards certain animals, um, we like to nurture that. And so we tend to a response, um, I don't know, in a way that is not effective uh, when we are presented in the same room with that animal, for instance. Or this is just <laughs> an example of an animal, but you can also have um, other examples with other, um, what is it, situations. And then the last one, this is the last slide uh, for this, what is it, this, um, lecture on emotion is about comforting others. So the best way you can help others manage their grief is to engage in supportive communications, sharing messages that express emotional support and that offer personal assistance. Um, Amanda Holmstorm offers seven suggestions for improving your supportive communication. So whenever you have someone in your life who's grieving, who is under difficult situation um, and maybe they're not ready to talk yet, then you must know that there's always a time and place to do this. Don't force them to talk to you when they're not ready yet. When they're ready to talk though, you need to make sure that you find the right place and time and that you ask good questions that start with open-ended queries and that you legitimize but don't minimize their story. And that you're going to listen actively to what they're currently going through. And that you don't have to offer advice unless it seems like they needed it. So 
ask before you offer advice because they may not need your advice at that moment that they may not uh, they may just need for you to be there to listen to them and then show concerns and give praise for them to um, be able to share the story and open up to you yeah all right so that's the end of the emotion chapter and i'm going to ask uh, several lecture check questions on the discussion board thank you everyone